Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. Um, I bring you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at Westminster Presbyterian Church just up the road uh, in Bull Creek uh, in Perth. Um, So I'm glad to be here this morning. Um, Shelley and I have enjoyed uh, a few times now uh, this year being here, and uh, it's really been great. Um, And we get a good feed afterward at Simon's house, so I highly recommend the the restaurant at Simon and Sue's. Uh, You probably have tasted, some of you probably tasted there as well. It's lovely. How would you define success? This question is a bit like the Sunday school uh, teacher who asked her children, what has a long tail and a pouch and it hops around? And one little student in the class, some spiritually minded student, raised their hand and they said, well, Miss, um, I know the answer is supposed to be Jesus, but it sounds like a kangaroo. See, I know I'm asking a bunch of Christians, uh, a preacher asking a bunch of Christians on a Sunday, how would you define success? So I know you feel like maybe you should respond with some spiritually minded answer. But what would you say if you weren't in church? If this was a man on the street interview and somebody came up and asked you, how would you define success? But we know people like a a surgeon is successful when they can perform repeatedly uh, life-saving, intricate operations. We know that a musician is a success when they've mastered their instrument and they can perform it well in front of people. We know that a lawyer is a success when they can adeptly assist people from uh, getting into further legal problems or even get them out of legal problems. And since we're really interested in non-churchy answers, we know that all of these people would be, success, would be a success if they made lots of money doing what they do, right? That's how we would normally kind of think right away about answering that question. Of course, musicians don't make a lot of money, but anyway, all the other ones would make a lot of money. See, now for the challenge for us, as biblically-minded Christians, how does the Bible define success? Success is not what the health and wealth gospel preachers tell us. It's not about prosperity and just ask and God will give you. You know, have enough faith and God will deliver. That's not success, biblically speaking. In fact, our study in Joseph's life, the study that we're going to do this morning, will show us that that's actually opposite. It's upside down. It overturns all the unbiblical and unspiritual definitions of success. This life of Joseph. Genesis 39 provides us a glimpse into the life of of Joseph when he was highly successful but he was a highly successful slave he was highly successful and then he became a highly successful prisoner he's going down the wrong way if you're looking at the world's view of success Joseph's story reveals three things It reveals the source of success, real, true, biblical success, the source of the success. It shows that success is tested as well. And then it also shows us the endurance of success, how success actually continues with us. And we'll see it here first in the source of success. Look at verse 1. This is a bit of an update from a previous chapter was on the life of Judah. So chapter 38 was on the life of Judah. And he was a bit of a rotter and did some naughty things. So it's kind of updating us on back to Joseph. Uh, So verse 1 tells us Joseph's situation from the end of chapter 37. Potiphar, the Egyptian, we're told, bought Joseph from the Ishmaelites who brought Joseph into Egypt. In other words, his brothers had sold him into slavery to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites brought Joseph to to, uh, Egypt, and from there, Potiphar buys Joseph as a slave. This means that Joseph has now been taken away from the land of Canaan, from the land of promise. He was being sold into slavery in Egypt, This does not appear to be a very successful move. 
It's the wrong direction. It's not going into the land. It's coming out of the land. Especially when you consider God's promise to Abraham way back in Genesis 12, where he promises promises, uh, Abraham and his offspring a land, a place. And combined with what we learn in chapter 38 about Judah, and I know we haven't been through it, but Judah was a bad guy. He did some bad things. Um, He did some immoral things. And it seems like the offspring of Abraham, now second and third generation, are now sort of going the wrong way away from the promise of God. uh, Joseph's been forcibly taken into slavery. And Judah doesn't even care about acting in a godly fashion. They don't seem to care about God's blessing at all. However, being taken away from the promised land, we still see in this chapter a bright spot. A very big bright spot. Because the Bible tells us in verse 2, look what he says, that the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. It's a bright spot. Things seem to be going the wrong way, but the Lord is with Joseph. Okay, so how do we know that they're really connected? That the the prosperity or the success of Joseph is connected with the Lord's presence? Well, we see it in a couple different ways. First off, verse 2. It pretty much tells us the Lord was with Joseph and he succeeded. So just from the very, you know, English, uh, the grammar here can tell us it's connected. But also look at verse 3. It tells us in another way that it's connected. His master, this is Joseph's master, Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, was with Joseph, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. When your pagan master notices the success and the Lord's presence in your life, when the the pagan master in Joseph's life sees that his success is related to the presence of the Lord, it's a pretty good indication that that's that's the case. It's obvious. Even Potiphar could see that the Lord was with Joseph and he had success. Lastly, we see that Potiphar increasingly trusted Joseph. First off, he notices his success in verse 3. And then in verse 4, it says that Joseph found favor in Potiphar's sight and he attended him. In other words, Joseph became a trusted member of the slave staff, if you put it that way. And so he personally attended Potiphar. And then Potiphar puts him in charge of everything. Joseph, you've shown yourself trustworthy. I know you and I can trust you with the whole household. Not just with looking after me, but looking after everything. You see, it was the Lord's presence with Joseph that made him successful. Potiphar noticed it, and he favored Joseph, and he trusted Joseph with all he had with his whole entire household. Okay, so that's a good indication. But also note something else here that's really interesting. Potiphar receives a bonus. He receives a blessing because he favored Joseph. Verse 5 tells us that from the time that he made Joseph the overseer in the house, over all that he had, look what it says, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and field. If you have any doubts that the Lord's presence was the key to Joseph's success, I think that should be gone by now. We've shown it in three different ways. Plus, the Lord's presence brought Joseph's success and the Lord blessed Potiphar and all of his household because Potiphar favored Joseph. Incidentally, that is actually God keeping his promise from way back in Genesis 12, when he promises Abraham, he promises Abraham and his offspring, those who bless you, I will bless. This is God doing this generations later, honoring his word, keeping his promise to bless those that bless the offspring of Abraham. 
It's all connected. The Lord is faithful. Now, if you do the maths, Joseph was in Potiphar's home for about 10 years. And I'm not going to take you through all the little passages, but just so you know, he's been in the, in the household of Potiphar for about 10 years. And that helps us to understand a bit of Joseph's success. It's clearly tied to the Lord's presence. We've already seen that. But it did not occur overnight. This is a decade that he's in Potiphar's house. When Joseph arrived in Potiphar's house, he had to learn the language. He's not Egyptian, he's Hebrew. So he has to learn the Egyptian language. He has to learn the Egyptian culture. He has to learn how, house, how the uh, Potiphar's household functioned. He has to know, you know, when does Potiphar like his dinner? What time do we plant for the garden? What time do we get up? What time do we go to bed? What, you know, he has to learn all this stuff. Now, many of you here today, I think, have probably come from somewhere else. Somewhere in your life, you had to make an adjustment to Australia. You had to learn the culture, maybe not the language. When my family and I came here, we had to learn the language. You know, we speak American, not English, apparently. And so when we came here, we have to learn the language. It took a while. See, the Lord's presence with, was with Joseph. And he gave him success. But, but Joseph was not spared from hard work. Joseph had to work hard to show himself faithful, to show himself confident, competent, to show himself trustworthy. He had to work hard to get to that level. Joseph remained his slave, remained a slave, yet in his difficult circumstances we see that the Lord was with him and gave him success. And the Bible is here challenging us, isn't it? It's challenging us to show us that success doesn't mean ease. Success doesn't mean instant, everything done, push button, goes my way kind of thing. The Lord was present with Joseph, but he didn't have an easy life. He had to work hard, and he didn't get everything right away. But now we're going to see that Joseph's success was tested. One crucial question as we move into point two. How did Joseph react to the Lord's presence and Potiphar's favor? How did Joseph react? Did he take it for granted? Well, no, he did not. That's what we're going to see in this section. Now, this section is the bulk of our passage this morning. It's from 6 to 20, from verse 6 to verse 20. And what we're going to see is that Joseph treasured both the presence of the Lord with him and his master's favor, Potiphar's favor. How do we know that? Well, when Joseph is tempted by Potiphar's immoral wife, by Mrs. Potiphar, his immoral and aggressive wife, when he's tempted by her, he remains faithful to the Lord and he remains faithful to Potiphar. Right from the very end of verse 6 and on into verse 7, look at how this aggressive woman, this immoral woman, Potiphar's wife, look at what she says to Joseph. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife caught eyes, cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. Potiphar's wife lusted after Joseph, and she told him of her evil desire to lie with him. And this is a horrible test. This is a horrible test for someone like Joseph. I mean, he's in his early teens or maybe his, early, his late teens or early 20s. He's in the prime of life. But he's also at the top of the household. He's in a very high position in the household of Potiphar. Verse 6 told us, Potiphar left everything in charge of Joseph. 
Potiphar only had to concern himself with the food he ate. He just had to, you know, pick up the fork and stick it in his mouth. But Joseph took care of everything else. Now, Joseph could have rationalized, right? He's in this situation. He's facing this temptation. He could have rationalized many reasons to break trust, to be unfaithful. Well, first off, he was young. He has urges. He's a young male. He has urges, right? He's got no family around him. He's got no family to consult with, no mom or dad to look after him. He's got no mom to go, now Joseph, you do the right thing. You know, he's got no one to to keep him on the right track. Sorry, moms or grandmoms. And, um, And there's no one to, you know, to push him into being obedient. He's in a new culture. And he could rationalize, well, maybe this is just the way it happens in Egyptian households. You know, the, the, the chief servant gets to sleep with the wife. I mean, he could have rationalized all of this. He could have reasoned that Potiphar has trusted me with everything. So maybe the wife is okay to sleep with her because she's part of the household. See, that would have been a terrible rationalization. It would have been the wrong thing to do. But he could have made those rationalizations. Also, just to point out, too, he's got no church family. He's got no family around, no church family around. He doesn't have a prayer group or a Bible study. He doesn't have a lot of things around him that we would sort of count on to keep us on the right track. How did he survive this onslaught? How did this man stand in this time of temptation? Well, first off, look at what he does right away. This is on her first offer to lie with me. That's the first offer. What does he say right away? Verse 8, we're told immediately. He responds this way. Verse 8, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. He has put everything he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am. And Joseph is not saying, I'm equal with Potiphar. He's saying, I'm in a high position and I know it. I'm a slave in a high position and I understand that. That's what he's saying there. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you. See, Joseph saw himself as Potiphar's servant. He knows he's just a slave. He doesn't think highly of himself. He knows his position. And he knew that his master's wife was off limits. Taking another man's wife is wrong, and Joseph knew it. If you know some of the story from previous, Judah did not act properly sexually. It's sort of the contrast to Joseph here, and I'm I'm just pointing that out so you know. In the context, Judah was horrible, Joseph is admirable. Joseph knows that he is trusted by Potiphar. And he treasures that trust. And so he remains faithful. But that's not all Joseph says, is it? If you look at the rest of verse 9, Joseph knows that the Lord is with him. Joseph knows that Potiphar knows that the Lord is with him. And so Joseph says in verse 9, at the end of verse 9, he says, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? In Joseph's mind, that's all the reason he needs to remain faithful to Potiphar and remain faithful to the Lord. He treasures the source of his success. He knows that it's the Lord's presence with him that's giving him success. And more than any wicked sexual pleasure, any temptation that he's faced, he knows, I want the Lord more than any of that. In addition, he treasures his master's trust. And he knows he's in a position and he's not going to steal the master's wife. Well, of course, you know, with that kind of reasoning, with that kind of integrity, with that kind of response 
to Potiphar's wife, to Mrs. Potiphar, of course, what does she do? Oh, well, Joseph, I can see your point. Well, of course, I'll never talk about this again. Yeah, absolutely. You're off the hook. I won't ever... Is that what she does? No. That is not what she does. Unfortunately for Joseph, that's not what happens. Instead, the testing continues. And it grew worse. Look at verse 10 to 12. Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, spoke to Joseph day after day. I'll add one more, after day. Just ongoing, day after day. Joseph would not listen to her. He would not lie beside her. And it says, or would he be with her? In other words, he wasn't even in the same room alone together with her, day after day. He was just careful. Stay away from this woman. This is not good. But then we read verse 11. But one day, he went to the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house. One day, she caught him alone. In verse 12, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. That test that began with one solicitation, then these daily repeated solicitations, and finally ends in this forced attempt to lie with Joseph. At this point, after reasoning with Potiphar's wife, what we saw in verse 9, after trying to avoid her, what we saw in verse 10, trying to just not be in the same room alone with her, all he could do when she grabbed him at this verse, at this point, well, look at what it says in verse 12. He left his garment in her hand, and he fled, and he got out of the house. What do we see about the test, this test that Joseph has endured for all these years? He passed the test, didn't he? He passed it. He got away. He fled the temptation. Yay, Joseph. He passed his test. He fled the wicked temptation. Now, what do we expect when we we pass a very difficult exam? When you're in school and you passed a very difficult exam, what do you expect? Over the years, I've watched our three children. They've all gone through their year 11 and 12 WACE exams. You might have seen this with your children or your grandchildren. They get through all these big, huge exams, these big tests, and then they get done. And Shelley and I have noticed when our kids are done with all their exams, there's relief and there's joy. They're all excited. And it's not just for the students, it's for the parents as well. We, we're so relieved, we're so joyful that our children are done with these exams. But that wasn't Joseph's experience after passing the test, was it? There was no relief. There was no celebration. There was no pat on the back for Joseph. Instead, Potiphar's wife lied about Joseph's actions. She slandered Joseph. Not just to the household staff, but to Potiphar himself. And when Potiphar hears of this lie, this slander, of course he doesn't know it's a lie or slander, but as he hears what his wife says, verse 19 tells us his reaction. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, she said, his anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And there he was in prison. What's Joseph's reward for doing the right thing? Prison prison, prison. You know, it's entirely likely that Potiphar could have killed Joseph on this false word, this accusation from Mrs. Potiphar. 
Thankfully, however, her false accusation didn't end Joseph's life. While we're not told exactly why he didn't kill Joseph for this accusation, it may be that Mrs. Potiphar, it was her that sort of lacked a faithful reputation. She might have done this before. And the reason I say that is, look at what it says. After Potiphar's wrath was kindled, after he was angry, it doesn't say who he was angry with. It just says his anger was kindled. Now look, this is just, just a guess. I think it's a reasonable guess, but you know, it doesn't say exactly. And so it could be that Mrs. Potiphar was somewhat known for this kind of thing which is maybe why Joseph wasn't killed right away for being accused of doing what he was accused of. Anyway, we don't know, but I'm just taking a guess there. Prior to the test, we do know that the Lord was with Joseph. And it was the Lord's presence that caused him to succeed. And then Joseph goes through these awful tests. His life was spared, but now he's in prison. He's an outcast. Have you ever gone through an awful period in your life, a test, maybe maybe the loss of a spouse or maybe the decline of your health or maybe a loved one who's gone through these terrible things and you go through these tests and it just doesn't seem to let up and it just seems to grow worse? Well, then you can identify with what's going on with Joseph, can't you? The tests go from bad to worse. Things go from high to low and then to lower. (laughs) And maybe in those times you ask yourself, Lord, are you with me? Am I ever going to know your blessing again? Am I ever going to get there again? Success? Am I ever going to know any kind of success again? Well, praise God. As we move into our last point, as Joseph moves into prison, is moved into prison, we get the answer to that question. We get the answer to that question in verse 21 as we look at the endurance of success. How is the success going to endure in Joseph's life? Look at verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of of the keeper of the prison. The answer to you and to me in the face of difficulties that keep getting more difficult and the times that just seem like they're endless tests, the answer is that the Lord is still with His people. He's still present with you. Your circumstances may look pitiful, but the Lord is still with you. And that's what Joseph is learning here. The Lord is still with him. And he gives him favor in the sight of this prison guard, this prison keeper. The Lord is still with Joseph. Praise God. In addition, we're told that Joseph was showed the Lord's steadfast love. Now that's a special word in Hebrew. The word is hesed. It's the, it's the steadfast covenant love of God. It's unending love. The promise of God to be with His people and to love them forever. This isn't just the Lord's favor, the Lord's blessing. This is hesed, the showering kind of love that the Lord just showers on His people. It's like drowning you in a, in a good way. You know, drowning you in His love. It's just the showers of blessing. God's Word is telling us that the Lord is with Joseph, but not even just with Joseph. He's not just present with Joseph, but God's Word is here indicating us, assuring us, by using this word hesed, that this is the absolute best place for Joseph to be for the sake of God's people. Using the word hesed is giving us a hint that God's plan is greater than just delivering Joseph, this one man, 
God's plan is when Joseph is in prison and thrown in prison, this is going to be the place where God is going to use this, not just for the benefit of Joseph, but for the benefit of all of God's people. This is going to work out for the benefit of all of God's people. The success that Joseph enjoys here in this passage will be for the benefit of all of God's people as God's plan unfolds. It's a great encouragement to you and to me. It's a great encouragement to the people of Joseph's day. They may not have seen it right then, but as they know the story and learn the story, that's what it's indicating. However, for now, we're only going to see in this little section a repeat of what Joseph experienced back in Potiphar's house. Joseph is in prison, but because, because the Lord is present with him, the keeper of the prison favors Joseph. It's a lot like what we saw in Potiphar's house. Potiphar recognized the Lord was with Joseph. And again, we see the favor coming to Joseph. Then look at verse 22 and 23. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners that were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. Joseph was left in charge to do it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything except that was except all the uh, to anything that was in Joseph's charge, because the Lord was with him, and whatever the whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. In other words, it's just sort of ditto from what Potiphar, what happened in Potiphar's house. Early in Joseph's life, then we learn that he was hated and that he was rejected by his brothers. And they nearly killed him. And his brothers had treated him unfairly. And he was sold into slavery. And while he was in slavery, he was treated unjustly. He was accused falsely. And then he was thrown into prison. He's faith, te- faith death twice. But he was spared both times. See, Joseph's ordeal is here to teach us something to teach us some things that are really crucial. And what we focused on today is getting that understanding of what is biblical success. And it's here to teach us about that, biblical success. First off, the thing that we've learned already is that Joseph, the Lord was with Joseph through all his hardship as a slave As a prisoner, it didn't matter his status in society. The Lord was with him. That makes a difference. It's not about the position that you hold. It's about the presence of the Lord being with you. If he's with you, in God's view, you are and you will be successful. In the biblical definition, the Lord's presence is that guarantee. In the Lord's eyes, you are successful. The other thing this is teaching us is that the biblical definition of success is not about being at ease, having life easy, having things going everything your way, the nice cushy lifestyle. The world says that's success, but that's not the biblical definition. The Lord made all of Joseph's hard work succeed. He had to work hard to be the head of the household, to run the run the show, to be the head of the prison, to run the show. It was a lot of work. Biblical definition of success is someone who treasures the Lord's presence with them. And so what does Joseph do? He ran from temptation. He fled temptation. The world will tell you that enjoy the sinful pleasures. Enjoy this world. Life is all about enjoyment. That's not the biblical definition of success. You might have to take some hard choices. Flee temptation. Run away from those things that tempt us to do evil. The other thing that we've learned is that the Lord spared Joseph's life So that God's steadfast love will not just benefit Joseph, but benefit all of God's people. 
the biblical definition of success is not an individual making it big. The biblical definition of success will be a blessing to all the people of God. You see, God did not spare His own Son. Joseph was spared a couple times. But God sent Jesus and did not spare His own Son to deal with our sin, to deal with the unrighteous, the sinner, you and me, who turned against God, who didn't value His presence, who thought it was all about enjoying this life, getting everything for me. In Jesus, God is with His people. Emmanuel, that's what His name means. Emmanuel, God with us. You and I who know Jesus, God is with us. By the world standards, think about the life of Jesus. By the world standard, his life wasn't a success. A carpenter? A tradie? A savior who died on a cross? That's not success, is it? Not the world's definition. Jesus' work wasn't prestigious. He endured hardship, injustice, false accusations, Treachery, abandonment by his friends. Jesus resisted all temptation, didn't he? He fled all temptation. Even from the the, the main tempter himself, Satan himself, took on Jesus to try and tempt him to do evil. Jesus resisted all temptation. For you and for me. He died on a cross for the benefit of God's people. Not one man trying to save his own skin, but the Son of God who gave Himself up for you and for me. Joseph's story is a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus. Joseph's story turns the world's view of success upside down. Joseph's story reveals the dangerous folly. It is dangerous folly to have the world's view of success. Measuring success by your position, getting to the highest rung of the ladder, by how easy you've got it, how cushy you've got it. That's a bad, that's a wrong view of biblical success. By hiding away your sin, by by saying it doesn't really matter, Real success flees from sin. Or by hoarding all of God's goodness just for yourself, just for your benefit, being selfish with your goods, being selfish with your time, being selfish with your hospitality, spending it all on you. That's that's a wrong view of success. It's foolishness. Successful disciples, successful followers of Jesus, what does Jesus tell us? They will take up their cross, they will deny themselves, and they will follow Him. That's the biblical view of success. That's the path to biblical success. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do recognize that what You've taught us in the life of Joseph turns our world upside down. It challenges us, Lord. We are weak. We like cushy. We like things done for us. We like things going our way. But Lord, we also have lived long enough to know that that's not always what happens. Lord, we value your presence with us. Lord, help us to value it more. We long for the presence of Christ, and we know that He has promised His presence with us always. Lord, thank You for sending Jesus. And then, Lord, help us to deal with sin. Help us to be people who not just are blessed, but will bless others. That we look for ways to show and care for those around us and to be a blessing to those around us, to serve those around us. Lord, help us to stand in this evil day 
for the glory of Jesus, for the praise of His name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.